Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, April, April, <laughs> August, August 4th, 2016. This is the week and chart. So what do we talk about? Well, I got a user request for writing out uh, longer term positions, and that'll make a lot more sense in a minute. I've, I've done webinars on this in the past, but I think that this will complement what I have done. Also, I want to talk about the volatility fake out and the S&P 500 or possible volatility fake out and how you could use these things to your advantage. Uh, obviously, your questions on trading. Um, keep your questions on individual stocks, if you don't mind, uh, until the uh, end of the show where we get to the actual charts. And when you do ask about stocks, ask about them one at a time. You can ask about as many as you want. In fact, that's that's kind of the fun part of the show is when we, uh, we pick apart uh, the stocks, both good and bad. Anyway. And also, uh, what else? Oh, that's it. And this week's chart show is brought to you by me. Once again, you can get started with my core trading service for $47. Also have a sale, um, lowest price ever on the IPO course. And the IPO, the IPOs are still in the bull market. We'll, we're going to get to that in just a few minutes, too. All right, disclaimer screen, all predictions about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I got an email that asked me about trailing stops. I have to say that all your ideas I've added from your presentations have been very, very powerful. The one idea I'm trying to hone in on better is the one of stop management on the second loaf. I bet you have older presentations on the subject. I do, but I haven't found them yet. Um, look on my YouTube channel and look on my website under videos, and there's quite a bit of information there. Uh, thus far, I'm using about a 36% stop distance while doing the keep the change methodology. I'm going to explain keep the change in just a minute for those of you who don't know what that is. Uh, a 36% stop, that seems like a lot. That might be relevant, though, depending on the position. We opened up a position recently with a 34% stop. Yeah, that sounds kind of crazy, but it moved 34% in just a few days, and that's just as normal volatility. It is what it is. So that's what it requires. Now, you can't blanketly use a 36% stop because on some stocks, that might be ridiculously low or wide, I should say. So you can't, unfortunately, there are no fixed rules when it comes to trading, but we're going to flesh out a lot of these things. Thanks a million for these great ideas. And please don't do risky things out there like run into unlighted rigs. Steve. Well, I haven't been offshore in a while, and I don't see myself going offshore in the foreseeable future, although I do miss it. But uh, there's just too much going on in life, so don't worry about that. Um, you can only predict the short term when it comes to markets, as I quite often preach. And if you've got a stock that's at a really solid uptrend and it pulls back a little bit and it's a little oversold, you know there's a pretty good chance that it will bounce back to the direction of the underlying trend. Now, that doesn't mean that the longer term trend is going to resume. And also, it doesn't necessarily mean that the short term trend will resume, or I'm sorry, that it will bounce. But you do have a much better chance of capturing that swing trade. Unfortunately, as I often preach, you don't make enough money short term trading. So when people put out these short term trading systems and they tell you how great they are, what they fail to mention to you is occasionally you will get whacked. I mean, I got whacked overnight because uh, England decided to lower their rates from um, 0.25 to zero or something, right? And um, it happens, okay? You occasionally, you will get whacked. And if you're not making enough money in the meantime, then when you do occasionally get whacked, it's going to really hurt. So that's one of the problems with short-term trading. But you can only predict the short-term, so that creates a dilemma. So what I figured out is why not have your cake and eat it too? Why not trade for short-term gains but also be willing to stick around for longer-term gains? Now, that's sort of a have your cake and eat it too. And, you know, like Pinocchio being a bad motivational speaker, I just assume that everybody knew that, okay? And I was on a project a while back with some brainiacs, some very, very – uh, most of the people you probably would know on the project, and if you didn't know them uh, from a professional sense, if you were 
in the business, you would know them from, uh, they're not necessarily, pub not all of them are public figures, but I mean, you know, big names like Larry, Vic Millen, people like that, Greg Morris, et cetera, were on this project. And one of the guys uh, used to run a hedge fund, and he's a PhD or um, he's a brainiac. His nickname is uh, Techno Beast. I think uh, John Nigerian gave him that name. Anyway, what was kind of cool was I felt kind of humble to be on this project with these people, and I felt like a lot of what I was doing was really kind of oversimplified. It, it just wasn't going to be very impressive for these people. And this is the same project where I, I sat back and waited and waited until I found my opportunities. And I was told, that's fine. Don't invent trades by Peter Moffey. Anyway, what happened was once I started finding trades to submit, I would say, okay, well, I'm not just going to give you the trade. I also want to do the management on the trade. And in the management of the trade, we're going to scale out of half of it. And we're going to keep half. And we're going to widen out those stops gradually to ride out longer term trends. And that's where the real money is. Unfortunately, longer term trends are very hard to predict. You cannot predict them, but you can follow them forever. You might want to write that down. So when I started doing this, it's uh, the guy I was talking about, Jan, is like, hey, uh, he was tracking everybody's performance to see how we were doing. And he's like, you know, what Dave's doing is really cool. I never thought about it like that. And I was really flattered and blown away. I just thought everybody do this, okay? But everybody doesn't know how to do this. And this really is the secret sauce, if there is a secret sauce out there. Because sooner or later, you're going to get whacked. I mean, England's going to raise rates. The United States is going to do something stupid, Okay. I guess it's only something stupid if, if you're on the wrong side of it, right? <laughs> but a lot of times the market will have a whipsaw to something, even if it is good news for you, that might knock you out. And trust me, it happens. But when you're short-term trading, sooner or later you're going to lose a lot, and then you're going to have to make it back. A lot of times they'll call that an anthill strategy. If you see someone says, hey, we got this 90% correct system, why don't you buy it from us? Or why don't you pay for the signals from it? Well, that's great, and it might be 90% correct, but what happens when it hits that occasional outlier? And that's what's going to kill you in that trade. So the secret sauce is capturing that longer-term gain. You must, you must, you must position yourself to capture the occasional home run. You must allow for limited losses, and I should say somewhat limited losses because you will get whacked, and then the potential for unlimited gains. And it's not by way or highway, but quite often you'll hear me preach against these so-called income-producing systems. Trust me, if I had an income-producing system, I would keep it to myself, okay, if it was that good. If you had an edge that always worked, which you don't, by the way, which no one does, but if you had a statistical edge that always worked, then keep it to yourself. Think about what casinos do. They have a half a percent statistical edge on, on some of their big games where the big money is played, but it's a multi-trillion dollar business. So you never know what your edge is going to be, and there is no money-making machine. But what you could do is you could position yourself for a short-term gain and then stick around for a longer-term gain. So ideally... You want to get that short-term gain in using relatively small stops, and I'm going to discuss that in one second, and then allow that stop to gradually open up. Now, in the end, as I preach, you're going to give up some of those open profits, and that just comes with the territory. It happens, okay? So let's take a look at some of these things. My inbox is getting slammed. People are probably trying to get in. That's okay. We're recording it. Now, when you go to place your initial stop, that's going to be made on the fact that's going to be based on the volatility of the underlying instrument and how long you want to hold the positions. Now, as I often say at the beginning of this, and this is stealing a line from Greg Morris, all predictions about the future, a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Stuff was spelled S-H-I-T when he first said it. So... The longer you want to be in a position, the wider your stop's going to be. Now, if you're taking a swing trade, 
then that stop can be fairly small within reason because you're just trying to ride out a small term, short term volatility. The short term, I should say, adverse move against you. But if you're going to try to do a longer term trade, you want to stay in for weeks, months, or even years, then that stop is percentages to go up tremendously because a lot of stuff could happen between now and then. So this is where the accuracy will be, or you'll be more accurate here. You're going to be less accurate here, and you're going to risk a lot of money here. But this is where the real money is. Okay, but we all read, as I say, ad nauseum, and we all read about these famous longer term traders. But what we fail to read is that they subsequently blow up. And even the ones that don't blow up, if you look at their records, you'll see that there are quite a few times where they lose over 50% of their value. Now, the average hedge fund would blow up at that number, but some of these people that have survived year after year, they the I don't know why, but people just allow them to to do this and and I don't know. But the average mortal man would blow up at a fifty percent drawdown. So the real money is here, but it's unpredictable. And the more sure thing is here, but then something bad could still happen. So if you could make the transition from here to here, again, that's the secret sauce. Now the volatility of the instrument is going to determine where your underlying stop will be. That plus the time that you're going to spend in the market. So if you're in an instrument that's not very volatile, then your stop percentage isn't going to be that big. And conversely, if you're in an instrument that's very volatile, then your stop percentage is going to be much bigger. Now, the good thing is with my stuff is the bigger your stop is, the smaller your position will be. In fact, I actually recommend trading more volatile, more volatile stocks, he tried to say, within reason, because that's where the money is. Now, keep in mind that if you are trading properly, John, hold off on your stock picks. Uh, we'll get to them in just a minute. So if you're trading properly, two things are going to happen. The price is going to move higher, okay? So your stop's going to have to widen out because point-wise, that stop's going to move more. And then the second thing that's going to happen if you're trading properly or if you capture a move is that volatility will begin to expand. So those are two things that happens in addition to your trying to ride out that longer-term trend. So let's take a look what that looks like. So this is a, a chart from a webinar I did a while back. So it's somewhere on YouTube. I don't have the date on it, but if you dig around, you could find it. Um, and if not, I can find the date of the original slide. So in this particular case, we had a, a buy at B IPO setup. Now, you might notice that this has a little bit of a breakout characteristic. That's the only pattern so far in the last 30 years that I've traded that has a bit of a breakout characteristic. Now, you'll notice that the volatility was fairly low. And this is based on a 50-day HV. But notice as a price begins to increase and accelerate higher, which is the ultimate goal, then that volatility is going to increase. So the point I'm trying to make is sometimes when you get into a trade, you end up with a different animal. Now, we're trying to transi transition over to the longer-term trend. And I'm completely okay with a stock that just kind of creeps along, creeps along, creeps along, creeps along. But it's also certainly much more exciting and rewarding, at least shorter term, when they just take off. Now, if you do hit it exactly right and they take off, even though the move's not sustainable, you do want to try to ride out as much as possible just in case it is. Or you want to stay with the position as long as you can just in case it is. So... The nature of the vehicle that you're trading does change. And as price increases, especially if it begins to accelerate higher, then the volatility is changing. In this case, drastically, you could see. So this is two different animals. So in making that transition, you want to make sure you're loosening that stop up. 
to go from that short-term swing trade stop to that longer-term trend-following stop. Now, as I often say, and as uh, Steve alluded to, you could play little games. And in markets, that's one way I get wrap my head around things and live with things is as I play a little games with myself. And sometimes uh, I use a little phraseology. I kind of channel, uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, Jir, I can't think of his name off the top of my head. I could see his face. But like the John Adams guy, you know, I said good day, sir. You know, when I get stopped out of a stock, well, I'll drop an F-bomb too. But sometimes I'll goof around and say stuff like that. And it kind of makes me giggle. And next thing you know, I'm able to say next and move on and not let it affect me. Um, another game is keep the change. So if a stock makes an incremental move higher, I might just leave my stop where it is and not bother. Now what happens is the stop, which the distance is from here to here, goes up just ever so incrementally from here to here. Now, if that happens repeatedly, that stop will slowly widen out over time. So that's one way to let that stop slowly widen out. And again, we're trying to make that transition further down that graph from the short-term trade to the longer-term trade and be able to ride out some of the con corrections along the way, hopefully all the corrections along the way. So I call that keep the change. And the reason I call it that is if it goes up a few cents, then don't bother. I mean, depending on the price of the stock, but let's say something goes up 25 cents and it's a $20 stock, then don't bother bumping your stop up 25 cents. Keep the change, okay? And if that happens occasionally throughout your trade, that stop is going to get wider and wider and wider. Now, the other thing that I like to see is gaining ground. Now, I often preach about mentally monetizing positions. And by that, I'm saying, let's say you're up a couple thousand dollars on a position. You immediately think, oh, a couple thousand dollars, I could pay off the credit card, or I could pay a month's mortgage, or I could do whatever with that money. And that's what that's what's called mentally monetizing money. Well, your trading account has to be a separate entity from everything else. And you have to just kind of view that as a business, as, a, as you're running the business. And these are the gains and losses that you're going to have in your business. But you can't, you can't immediately mentally monetize those because that's going to make you want to Take that two thousand dollars. Well, if you take a two thousand dollar gain, you'll never make a ten thousand dollar gain. Okay. And then the next question always follows. But Dave, how many times do you get a ten thousand dollar gain or two thousand dollar gain? Well, not that often, but you'll never get it if you don't allow that position to do what it has to do. And you'll never get that big longer term gain. And that big longer term gain is crucial because you will occasionally get whacked for two thousand dollars. OK, so one thing I like to see is kind of like gaining ground. And let's say a stock goes up three points. Well, I might only bump my stop up two points. So I've gained two points on that position. Now, the reason I talk so much about mentally monetizing that position is. And I'm going to use the word try because it's not always that easy. But try not to look at where the stock is here. And think about how much money you're making. Look about, look at where your stop is, and then think about how much money that is. So it's it's how you phrase things, and how you look at things, and how you view things that can really help you out. So you can say, okay, well, if I get stopped out, I'm going to make this amount of money here. Again, don't mentally monetize it here because you're going to be inclined to take that profit, or if you do get stopped out, you're going to get pissed off because you gave up some open gains, whether you make money on the trade or not. I get emails all the time. Dave, we gave up too much on this. Okay, fine. Send me whatever you made on the trade. You, you made 150% of the trade. Send me that money. 
and go center yourself. Go get a massage. You know, keep enough money out to get a massage, as I often say. Send me that money. P.O. Box 298, Beta Springs, Louisiana, 70420, Synthetic Trading, LLC. I, I, I have yet to get a check in my mailbox. Okay? So if you make money, you made money. Be happy. And the way I wrap my head around it is I look at this amount here and say, okay, well, if I get stopped out, I know I made that much. And every time this happens and that stop gets bumped up a little further, I say, okay, well, that feels pretty good. I know I made that much. I mean, obviously, something bad could still happen. But for the most part, usually, especially if your stop is widened out to a point where you can um, survive these normal corrections, then the chances of you you're gapping through that stop are, are fairly slim. Okay, But it's still possible. You, you never can escape the black swan in this business. That's the so-called black swan by Talib, meaning that there will be some big outlier moves against you. And that happens. But for the most part, if you are in that longer-term trend-following mode, then the chances of it gapping through that stop are, are not huge, okay? Accept the service fee. The account pays that easily. Oh, thank you, Craig. Appreciate that. Craig's a fan and a friend. Um, so the question is, as Steve was asking or alluding to, is like, where exactly should that stop should that stop be? And again, if you want a lot more information on this, I'm just going to kind of touch upon it today. But I have plenty of YouTubes out there, and uh, if we have time, maybe we can explore how to how to get those. But if you subscribe to my channel and then do a search within the videos, just put it the word stops. You should get a plethora of videos on that. Also, DaveLandry.com slash videos, and then go to more videos, and then go to more videos, and you'll get tons and tons of information on that. Also, I'm uploading a bunch of old, what I call classic weekend charts, which have a lot. But the quick answer to that is, ideally, it needs to be far enough away to ride out a longer-term correction or corrections, but not too far in case of bona fide reversals. So let's say you're long a position, and the position is right around here, and your stop's right around there, and then the stock begins to rally, or whatever other market you might be trading. Now, once it, been, once it begins to correct, you don't do anything with your stop. You stop trailing it higher. You trail a stop higher as it moves in your favor, obviously. So in an ideal world, you're able to ride off these corrections along the way, and by slowly loosening that stop up over time, you give it more and more room to ride out corrections in a longer term trend. Now, in the end, you will give up quite a bit. Again, let's not mentally monetize this. Let's just say, okay, this is how much we're going to get if stopped out. Bam, got stopped out. It sucks or does it? No, it doesn't suck because you got it here and you got stopped out here. That's a pretty good run, okay? Be happy with that or, or send me the money if you're not happy. I'll take it. I will take it. I got hungry kids, <laughs> hobbies, <laughs> a wife that constantly remodels stuff. <laughs> so I could use that money or somebody else in my family more appropriately could use that money. Anyway, so you want to let that stop slowly widen out with time. And the idea is to ride out the longer term corrections because you're changing hats from that trader to the longer term trend follower. Again, play games such as keep the change, and then also if you do have a very nice move in your favor, then take a, parsh, a portion of that move. So if it goes three points, maybe only bump your stop up two points. Okay. So again, where exactly should you place it? Well, as I've said in prior broadcasts, you need to ask yourself, where would you be wrong? Now, in this example that I just showed you here, a bona fide reversal, which pulls back below the prior pullback, that's no longer a correction because you're pulling back to the prior pullback. Another thing that I often talk about is, let's say, 
let's say you're long a stock and then it bases and it takes off again and you're trailing that stop, well, it really shouldn't come back in or especially below this base. So if your stop is below this base, that's a good point. And then sometimes it'll make another base and then go higher. So sometimes you get lucky enough to where you can kind of trail that stop from base to base or you trail a stop, a base forms, it takes off again. These are my all-time favorite. It's much more fun to catch that acceleration of trend and acceleration, which comes with the acceleration of volatility, but those moves are a little bit harder to sustain. Sometimes you get a stock that just kind of creeps along and builds these bases on top of bases, a la Darvis style. As I often say, if you could figure out a way to pick Darvis stocks ahead of time, then you know in the world. And I guess you could, if you could figure out a way to pick all these momentum stocks ahead of time, just like which is my stuff, then you'd own the world too. But as imperfect as things are, and as there are no exacts, you could still operate within this environment and do quite well longer term. Longer term being a key word in that sentence. So again, where would you be wrong? A prior base, okay, comes back to a prior base, or a large reversal, okay? Now keep in mind, the wider you let that stop loosen, even though it's going to be painful in the end, the, chance, the better your chances are of capturing that longer-term trend. There's always a trade-off. If you try to use a really tight stop, you're, you're going to almost always be stopped out. Okay? But if you use a little bit wider stop, within reason, you're going to get stopped out less and less. And by the same token, which are longer-term trend following, if you make that transition to a wider and wider stop, the chances of capturing that longer-term trend get better and better and better. But if that trend doesn't materialize or when, not if, that trend turns, remember all trades eventually and badly. As I preach, read my last post from last Friday. If you don't, if you haven't heard me say that before, which you have. So you're going to have to give up some in the end. Okay. But the chances of staying with that stock until the quote unquote end are much, much better if you let that stop widen out. Now, another thing that I've said in prior broadcasts, I guess I need to quit referring to prior broadcasts, but there is so much stuff out there. And as I, as I dig through my PC, I keep finding more and more and it's kind of exciting. I have so much content. Um, and I'm loading, uh, I'm loading them up on YouTube. So keep an eye out for those classics. I'm trying to get one up a day. So make sure you join that YouTube channel and uh, get in on that. But ask yourself where, would it hurt and suck, okay? And sometimes I'll be using this uh, keep the change and, uh, you know, let's bump it up just a couple of bucks. Let's say it goes up uh, three points. I'll bump it up two points, and I'll do all these little things. And somewhere in between, like it might not be keep the change, but let's say it goes up um, 75 cents. Maybe I'll just bump my stop up 50 cents, okay? And by doing this day after day after day, or every day I should say it moves in my favor, often by doing nothing, or not doing anything, which I think would be more grammatically correct, the stop winds out. But after a while, sometimes like I'll come in at the end of the day, and I'll go to check my stops, and I'm looking at the position, and looking at the portfolio on the spreadsheet, and I'm like, holy crap, if I get stopped out, I'm going to give up a huge amount of gains. Hey, Dave, I thought you said not to mentally monetize things. Well, do as I say, not as I do. But when you reach a point where you look at it and not so much mentally monetize it, but think, geez, that is a pretty big, that's a lot of ground to give up. So once you get to that point, you're probably far enough away to ride out some corrections. Now, that's a little esoteric, but again, common sense is your best ally. It's like, whoa, that's a long ways away. And then ask yourself, would that be a bona fide reversal if it hit that? Yes, it would. Or would that be below a prior base or whatever? Yes, it would. So sometimes just how you feel about it, provided you've been at this for a long time. If you haven't been in trading for a long time, then, then everything's going to suck. Okay, It's like every little bit of gain you give up is going to suck. But with time, you realize that's part of the process and you're willing to give up more and more and more. So where would it hurt? And quite frankly, suck. Now, like 99.27% of all of my stuff, 
Common sense is really your best ally. Don't overthink it, okay? And if you do get confused with it and, and you're really not sure, bring it up in the chart shows. That would be the best thing to do. Or you can ask me personally if you want. But the best thing to do is bring it up in the chart show. Let's take a look at it and let's figure it out. And if you want, give me a heads up ahead of time and we'll uh, I'll make some graphics to go along with it. So, again, common sense is your best ally. Now, as I've talked about before, let's shift gears here for a second. When volatility begins to drop, it tends to expand again, okay? So volatility tends to be cyclical. And some of this volatility stuff came from working with Larry Connors very early in my career. And he was really into volatility. And I got really hot and heavy into volatility. And uh, before I actually met him, I should say, I was doing some volatility work because uh, it's kind of a long story. But this is where I'm going with this. Sometimes you get these volatility fake outs. And I actually was writing, I actually had written about volatility fake outs back in the early 90s or mid 90s in Stocks and Commodities magazine. And I was using some of the uh, research of Connors and Natenberg, who did a lot of, I think this is where Cotton got, Connors got his research from on volatility. So I kind of borrowed from both of those guys. And by the way, no matter, it's kind of like, I, I just read a book, which basically says you end up borrowing from a lot of people in your career. And you will. And, and I didn't invent all these different things that I'm telling you. Some of them I did, like TKOs and things like that. But as far as the pullback and general things, I didn't invent all that. It was, it was just there. So I'm borrowing from others. Anyway, before I digress too far, I know, too late. So I had written about this volatility uh, fake outs. So volatility tends to be cyclical. But as I learned from Larry, it tends to overshoot itself, okay? So if it was just purely cyclical, cyclical it would look like a sine wave. Volatility meaning how much a market bounces around. Now, traders don't tend to agree for long. And that's when the volatility gets compressed. And it's kind of like a spring. Okay, the more that volatility gets tighter and tighter and tighter, the more it's likely to expand. So if you take a look at the S&P 500, we were in this really, really tight range. Now, I don't have volatility drawn in, but obviously volatility kind of overshot itself with this Brexit sell off and reversal. So volatility did this and then it just began to die and implode. Okay. Now, with volatility, sometimes your first move is a false one. So, and volatility, by the way, is based on closing prices. So let me just connect the closes in here to show you how ridiculously tight this volatility has been. I'm a member of uh, Tom McClellan's uh, professional forum, which is, used to be the old Bollinger Forum, and, and he invited all the members over to his uh, club. And I didn't read the articles. I just tend to read the headlines. But there, there was a lot of talk about how this is some of the flattest sideways trading in history in here, which I thought was pretty impressive. So traders don't tend to agree for long. Now, keep in mind that a market will often do the obvious thing in an unobvious manner. So it broke out. It looks like it's off to the races. So before it continues to go just straight up again, what's going to happen? Well, it's going to have a fake out move lower usually, okay? And if you – I don't trade a short-term pattern like this, at least not anymore for those aforementioned reasons about short-term trading. But if you do identify a very tight volatility type of situation, a very low volatility situation like this, then watch for a breakout. But more importantly, watch for a fake out first. So if you actually do identify a situation like this, the first move is often, not always, but often a false one. So what you could do is you could say, well, I'm going to go ahead and trade or take a position if it takes out that fake out bar. And that will actually test out. Just like big picture news reversals, like wait for some big news event like this. And then buy the market when it takes out that news high. Now, again, that's not a method that I trade. 
So why are you telling us? Well, the reason I'm telling you is this kind of could dovetail nicely into your your own analysis, your own prediction of the market, or at least figure out where the market is headed. And it's one more tool in your toolbox or arrow in your quiver, however you want to look at it, that kind of helps you wrap your head around things. And the more you can understand about how markets work, the easier your life begins. Okay. Now, again, not to beat the dead horse about prior presentations. I've covered this in a lot more detail previously. So if you go to my YouTube channel and search for volatility, you should get a plethora of um, presentations on this. Okay. Any questions on this so far? A couple more things I want to cover here. One thing that amazes me, and as I've said time and time again for the past, I guess, two, almost three years now, I keep saying, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to start an IPO service because I'm doing the work anyway. And I've been reluctant to do that for the past three years because I feel like as soon as I start the service, the IPO bull market's going to end. I should probably just do it. And if it ends, fine. I feel like, ah, I told you so. And if it doesn't, then, you know, it's a win-win. Who cares? Okay. If it doesn't, so what? But to my amazement, there's still a bull market in IPOs. One thing that that's kind of cool about it now, though, is that there's this demarcation. The demarcation has, has really widened between the good and the bad. And that's kind of awesome. And by that I mean, as I, if you go to this, um, if you go to my website, in fact, there's a banner ad on top of the screen now. This is on sale. But if you go there, there's a free, I think, hour and a half video just on trading IPOs to get started. And a lot of what's in there is very useful information. For instance, a lot of times I say IPOs, they either do what I call the die in the die pattern or they fly, okay? So if you didn't know anything or didn't get the course, just know you want to avoid the die and you want to trade the fly, okay? Now that might be Captain Obvious, but how many people are trying to buy it here or here or here or here or here, okay? So just trade the ones. It's almost like, as I said in the presentation, what Will Rogers used to say, buy stocks that go up. If they don't go up, they'll buy them. Well, at IPOs, you can do nearly just that, okay? So, again, the demarcation is pretty good. A lot of them are just doing this, but then a lot of them are also doing this, okay? So this is making it a little bit easier, and it looks like it's improving once again. So this is on sale. This is 60% uh, off. This is the lowest price that it's ever been. So I just, I know it's going to sound BS, but I just want to get the good, I want to get the word out of this. And, and uh, Steve, if you're here, maybe you could chime in. But Steve's a big fan of the IPO course, and he's been doing really well with it. And in some cases, I've been a victim of my own, own success um, with this. People have done so well in this that they stopped trading the core service. It's like, no, no, you got to, you have to do both, Okay. All right, let's hop into the charts. I want to show you before we get into the individual. If you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, uh, feel free to do so now. Sorry to hold you off so much. Uh, what I wanted to show you is the what's going on in the IPOs still. And you can see that they obviously, the ones that are obviously dying have obviously died. But then there's quite a few that are obviously headed higher. So that's the whole point is that they fly or they die. And you can see here's another one headed nicely higher. Higher, 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 higher. Okay. Higher, higher, higher. This one doesn't count. It's not enough, uh, not enough range in here. And see, like that one there, just kind of went sideways. It did nothing, okay? This would not be a trade by a lot of the metrics that I follow. So you would avoid that one. Um, race comes to mind. That's a good one. Let's see if we can get it to come up. 
So when Ferrari came public, what happened? It just absolutely imploded. Okay. So it's usually, or quite often, I should say, fairly obvious with these IPOs when it comes to trading them. And they either take off or they don't. And if they don't take off, you just want to avoid them. Okay. So watch the video on my website and I'll show you what that is. And it's it's a lot of good stuff in there if I say so myself. There's two ways to get to it right now. I'll show you the, the longer term way and the shorter term way. But if you go to my website, this little pop-up ad on the top, just click on that. And that's going to bring you to a page called Trade IPOs. And the reason I'm showing you that there's a video, if, if you don't do anything, okay, then watch this video that's in the middle of this page on trading IPOs. And it's, again, it's pretty good if I say so myself. My peers who advise me tell me that I shouldn't have an hour video on, on getting started. It should be like a 10 minute teaser, but I didn't want to just put a teaser out there. I wanted to give you some meaningful information. So you'll say, Hey, if he's giving away this much and this is this good, what happens if I have the whole thing? And again, it's been a big, I've been very proud of, of that IPO work. Uh, probably more than a lot of stuff that I've done publicly because it's, it's just worked so well. So check it out if you get a chance. Now let's take a look at the overall market. Keep the stock picks coming. My apologies for those uh, link issues, but I think I think I figured out what happened. Uh, go to webinar. You have to keep adding new webinars in. And if you stop, then, then it all resets. Uh, again, peas have been flattered in a pancake. Let's just check out this, this percent gain here. So 0.33%, and, and as long as I've been doing this, I cannot remember the market going two weeks and change and only making a 0.33% move on a net-net basis. So that's pretty darn impressive. So this could have been a fake out. My big concern, as I've been saying ad nauseum, is that couple things when you have a sharp leg higher like this it's hard to mount a new leg on top of the old one the good news is a market can walk off an overbought condition by going sideways in other words it can adjust to the new level the new norm so 2150 might be perceived as the new value zone as opposed to 2100 which is in the sideways soup but if you don't clear that prior range decisively then if it does correct too much, you're back in the sideways range. So we've got to pay attention to that. So it's not the all clear because we're above 2100, but it certainly is a good start. And shorter term, like I said, we did have a little bit of a fake out. How much follow through we get to the upside, nobody knows, but it'll be interesting to watch. Now let's take a look at the NASDAQ. One thing that's been concerning me in the NASDAQ is that, as I often preach, I like to see a market head higher and then accelerate higher, not head higher and then decelerate higher, okay? So that's always concerning. And we still haven't gotten to all-time highs yet. But the market has been improving. So you don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth too much because the market obviously has been improving here and we're not that far away from all time highs. So, so far so good, but here's the deal. There's always something to worry about, especially in markets, okay? Now, let's take a look at the Rusty. Rusty, it's kind of the same sideways action here, a little bit of a fake out so far trying to recover from that. So far, so good. My only problem with the Rusty is still somewhat overbought in here, intermediate term, and then still has quite a bit of overhead supply to overcome. So for the most part, still looking pretty good. Yeah, keep those, those ETFs great. Yeah, we'll take a look at those ETFs. So that's what's going on with the Russell. Uh, some areas in here never did get back to their old highs like chemicals, and some areas in here kind of bumped up against their recent highs and kind of rolled over. For the most part, though, most areas have been improving. Uh, energies broke out of the range and then came right back in. So that's a bit of a bummer. But let's say you were in longer-term trend-following mode. 
well, it shouldn't come back below 800 because then this new trend might be ending. This might just be a big consolidation, could have a new leg higher. Looks like today we're having a pretty good day, up about 2%, okay? So I think the energies are still in an uptrend from lows and in a bigger picture, longer term emerging uptrend. But shorter term, I don't like the action. So I would avoid new positions and energies for now. Are you shorting anything? No, not yet, but I will. I'll answer that in more detail in a minute. All right, so let's take a look at the metals and mining. Metals and mining doing pretty good in here, and we're up towards these multi-year highs, so so far so good. Trend looking a little bit better than the energies there. You can see broke out, pulled back a little bit, now trying to break out again to new highs. So far so good there. Uh, gold and silver for the most part look pretty good. We had little minor corrections in here. Uh, it's been kind of hard to get on these markets, uh, except the gold commodity actually did an okay pullback a while back. Um, I was forced to do a recommendation of the week uh, in a webinar I did recently, and I said buy gold, and so far that's working out pretty nicely in here, knock on wood. Um, some areas did break out like the foods and came right back in. Well, I don't really care about the foods anyway for the most part, but – there are, there are some areas that are kind of looking questionable or iffy, but for the most part, again, things are improving. Take a look at drugs, broke out of their sideways range. Uh, health services have been doing very well in here, up towards new highs, as you can see. Uh, retail, doing pretty good. I don't like the losing steam or the fact that they've been losing steam in here. They kind of shot up and then drifted higher. I'd rather see a market, believe it or not, take off and then drift lower because this is a normal correction. This kind of buying or wedging, as it would be called in uh, like an Edwards and McGee or Schaubach or classical technical analysis type of book. It's just like a market that's running out of steam. Uh, now, it can continue higher. That's what gold did a while back, and it faked me out, quite frankly. Gold kind of took off and then kind of drifted higher, and I'm like, uh-oh, that's actually bearish when the market just kind of drifts higher. And then, of course, it took off again. So keep in mind that you can't say, oh, but Dave, you said gold was drifting higher, and, it, and to be careful, and it went higher anyway. Well, a market can do whatever it wants to do. It doesn't always care about you, me, or the guy who screams on TV. But as a general statement, this pattern here is not really a good pattern to trade. I'd rather wait for that follow-through to see what happens. So overall, things are improving. Let's take a look at bonds real quick. Uh, bonds are kind of getting a little choppy in here. They're trying to go back to their old highs. Uh, extremely, you we're just off of what, all-time lows. It yields all-time highs in bonds, as I've been saying quite a bit. One has to wonder how far they could go. I know as a trend follower, we shouldn't say a market is too high to buy, but you also have to wonder is it worthwhile buying bonds at these nosebleed levels? So that's a little scary in here. The other thing that has me concerned is uh, when, not if, bonds top, will they become competition for stocks? Now, I guess, you know, as they say, what would the world be without hypothetical questions? But you can't sit around worrying about these things, but it is important that you have them in the back of your mind. And the reason is, not that you want to make these big picture predictions, but if you kind of come up with a couple of plausible scenarios, when the market plays out in one of those plausible scenarios, you're not surprised. Okay? So let's say bonds begin to crash, and all of a sudden stocks begin to crash, and you start freaking out. It's like, well, at least if you took a look at bonds ahead of time, and begin to say, oh, okay, well, I, that was a possible scenario. You're not as surprised, okay? And then as a general statement, when you're looking at a chart, ask yourself what could go wrong, what's the, what's the possible thing that could happen, okay, what's plausible, where would a fake out be, what a fake out look like. For instance, in the S&P 500, okay, as I said a minute ago, yeah, it looks pretty good. Shorter term, we got a little fake out here. We could go on the new highs. I like it. What could go wrong? Well, if we do correct an earnest in here, we're back in the sideways soup. And as I wrote in a an article, which is on the front page of my website, by the way, um, about trends, very simple trend following article for Proactive Advisor Magazine, I said one thing that concerns me is that this market had a pretty serious slide 
based on that Brexit. Now, it's good that it recovered, but that slide shows you how vulnerable this market can be. I make fun of a friend of mine's wife. We make fun of her because she says Von Run Bull. And ever since then, when I'm giving a presentation, I have to pause before I say vulnerable because I'm you know, bad karma. It's punishing me. Anyway, so the fact that it did have such a spill on a little news event shows that it is a little jittery. So if we have a bad news event come in or an event that's perceived as bad, it could put us back into the sideways soup. So that's always a concern. So overall, things are improving. There's always some caveats. Uh, somebody wants to look at SMH. I'm just going to take a look at the uh, semis first. Semis have been just kind of melting up in here. Very impressive. They just hadn't had much pullbacks along the way. So it's been kind of hard to get on recently but they will pull back and they will give us a, they will give some time to get in here's the thing if a market is beginning a longer term trend and it's going to sustain that trend then there's going to be plenty of pullbacks along the way people are like what if a market never pulls back it will somebody's going to need some money at some point for reasons that might have not reasons that don't have anything to do with the market the market's going to be jerked around by some sort of news event which it might completely blow off, and that will create a pullback and actually a buying opportunity. And if it doesn't, so what? There will be some other markets to trade. Trades are like a bus, right? A new one comes along every 10 minutes. Well, not exactly every 10 minutes in trading, but you get the picture. If you wait patiently, you get the point. If you wait patiently, eventually you will get new trades. Now, somebody was asking about SMH. It looks a lot like the semis in general. Nice, nice, nice breakout there, okay? Nice little uh, gaps higher. My Cajun just slipped out. People are like, you don't sound Cajun. I just said, there. <laughs> Look at that stock right there. <laughs> but you can see just not quite enough pullback for my taste. I'd like to see a little bit more knockout move. Nothing wrong with buying it as it continues higher here, but it would be a little safer. Not that it's ever safe in the market. If it had a little bit more knockout, a little bit more shakeout move here, shake a few more nervous Nellies out before continuing higher. Okay? So that's how I feel about SMH up or down up. Okay? Uh, would I buy it? No, I'd rather see a pullback there. And then I'd also like to see uh, some individual stocks setting up. And I think the opportunity would be in individual stocks. But as you may know, sometimes I will play these ETFs as a way to gain exposure to the sector uh, while searching for opportunities. Notice that this is an HV of 25. I'd much rather trade a, a, a stock maybe twice that volatility within the semis meaning that knowing that I have possibly twice the potential advantage. In other words, the inefficiency versus efficiency, okay? The, when you have an ETF, the stocks tend to cancel each other out. Yes, you get the efficient, inefficient ones, but there's also some efficient ones in there. Without digressing too far into efficiency uh, or to avoid that, read the article, Better the Devil You Know, on my website, which was a contribution, I think, to Traders Magazine. Um, the dollar, let's take a look at the dollar, okay? Well, dollar's kind of lost some steam in here as of late. Let's back the chart way out. So longer term or intermediate term, uh, longer term, the dollar's just kind of wide and loose and sideways. Much, much longer term, the dollar looks like it has topped, okay? Because you had this peak way back here, and so far we have not exceeded it. But I wouldn't rush out and short it just because of that. Let's take a look at like a weekly chart. Let's take a look at the weekly bow tie. Okay, yeah, as I said a few weeks ago, we actually this is kind of interesting. This is the longest I've ever seen a weekly bow tie take the form, but you can see it took like a year to form. So I think a major top remains in place, just like we had a major bottom back here. And you saw what happened afterwards. There's a major top in place, but I wouldn't rush out and short it. But, yeah, if you had to be short along, then by all means, be short. Don wants to know if I'm shorting anything. I'm not shorting anything right now. And the reason is I'm not seeing anything to short. Now, back in, as I told the story ad nauseum, but late 2007, I couldn't find a stock on the buy side to save my life. And the database was producing short after short after short after short after short. And I actually apologize to my clients. And I know that most people don't short, but I was actually apologizing to them a little bit because I know they don't short. 
is like, guys, I can't find a long to save my life. This is what the database is showing. So let's take a few shorts in here and see what happens. And then we all know what happens next, right? But right now is not one of those times. I'm really not seeing a whole lot of shorts. Now, I was a little bearish if you had to label me for quite a while because the market looked like it was rolling over. And then what did it do? Well, it went on to make new highs. So as a trend follower, I'm just going to follow along. So Don, uh, not shorting anything just yet. Carol wants to know about EWZ, which is going to be an ETF. You're welcome, John. EWZ. Yeah, it looks pretty good. This is Brazil. I've been uh, keeping an eye on Brazil. Um, there's been a Brazil stock or two. They could be a little choppy because they're foreign stocks. But, uh, yeah, it looks good. You had a bow tie earlier this year, which so far means the, the bottom is, is in. And now we're making new highs. So maybe on pullbacks along the way. Uh, it's a little choppy and hard to trade, but I hear you. Absolutely. So, uh, Carol, good eye on that one. And I've been keeping that one on my list. What is it, like CBD? Some of these Brazilian stocks have been popping up. But, you know, he took off, came back in. So it's kind of a bumpy ride, kind of hard to get in on these. But, yeah, bigger picture, there's a bottom in place. They're just kind of hard to hold on to. Hey, Dave, DLR short. That's going to be a uh, REIT, I think. Um, no, I wouldn't rush out and short it just yet. Let it bow tie down. It does. It does. It. Let me interview myself. Does it look like a major top? Yes. Uh, is it worth shorting? No, not just yet. Let it bow tie down. This could probably be uh, a correlated trade to the bond, to the upcoming bond crash. Maybe, maybe that's. <laughs> maybe I'd make a lot more money if, and be more exciting if I, the upcoming bond crash. Are you ready? You know, <laughs> put some of those click baits out there. But, yeah, I think I'd wait for a bow tie here before looking to go short. As a general statement, I don't like trading less efficient stocks, such as a REIT. Look at the HV22. And the reason is, let's say you buy a REIT, well, you're going to have to put on more shares because the volatility is low and something bad can still happen. But it's a little bit of a flip side when it comes to shorting. I'm okay with shorting something with a little bit lower volatility because it's going to be harder for a big event to push that stock much higher, especially a big, fat, established company like a REIT. So, yeah, keep an eye on this one as a possible short, but not yet. I think it's a little too early. I mean, it's kind of a micro first thrust if you did want to pick it apart a little bit. I mean, I hear you and I see what you're saying. Because it did have a thrust down, did pull back a little bit. It would have triggered right in here. But I think I would wait for something much bigger. You're welcome, Carol. TCMD for Donald. TCMD. Uh, this is an IPO. And this is, let's see, one, two, three. Let me spread them out a little bit. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, that's going to be a buy at B pattern. I'm not going to give you the entry on that. Uh, but start by watching the, uh, if you have the IPO course, yes, absolutely. That is that is set up. Um, but if you watch, start by watching the IPO intro video and maybe you'll understand. I might have given it away. Goro for Andre. It's going to be a gold stock. So far, so good there. Um, did I say dare again? Wait for the next pullback, though, okay? And if you're longer-term trailing stop mode, it's kind of extreme, but it should not come back, obviously, to this prior little pullback. And hopefully, I think you might be long, or I know you were looking to buy it a while back. Then uh, keep trailing that stop higher on that one. And then when it corrects, if it doesn't correct back to here, then you put a new stop and keep trailing higher. E-B-I-O. Well, the HV is a little nuts in this one, 164. That's even kind of nuts for my standards, okay? Um, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. It's a Jackie Mason stock, okay? Uh, I would pass based on the just the extreme nature of this stock. And you can see, yeah, it's going higher, but there's really no structure there. It, it goes up, it loses 75% of its value, then it goes up 200%. So it's just crazy. Um, the only way I would trade this stock is if, if you use a $4 stop, okay? Buy it right now at the market. 
and putting a stop at zero. I'm making a joke because that's kind of crazy. NRP. Yeah, this looks good. This is a, a mining stock. It needs a little bit more knockout, but it's one of those thin. Andre likes these really super thin stocks. You got to be careful when they get that thin. One, obviously, kind of choppy at trading. Two, uh, they can get pushed around quite a bit. Let's say somebody is a big holder of this stock out there for some strange reason besides the dumbest position. But, yeah, I can't argue with the fact that it looks pretty darn good. Nice, persistent move higher. But it needs a little bit more knockout move. It's, it's got to have knockout move to knock some people out. NGVT was this a TKO yesterday? NGVT, no, not really. Um, I mean, it's a pullback. Let's see something here. Let's see how you want to look at this. This is one we've been watching quite a bit. Another example, by the way, of an IPO. I mean, look at that. Bam, winning. Uh, it pulled back, but I don't. I don't see it as. I wouldn't call it a TKO. I wonder if I can get the. I can't get my chart to do what I want. Let's see. Uh, you know, it looked okay in here. It wasn't it wasn't the cleanest of all setups. So I wouldn't really call that a TKO yesterday. But yeah, I mean this is that's what's going on in IPOs. E M X X. A little bit on the thin side, not horribly bad. Uh, one thing that I'm seeing, though, kind of an extreme move in here from 40 cents to buck 30. That's what, four or five hundred percent or more. Um, it's probably too dangerous to trade because it's thin and the price. Sometimes you need to combine those two things, okay? Uh, if it's 100,000 shares traded on average and it's a $100 stock, then that's millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars being traded. But if it's 100,000 shares traded and it's a dollar stock, then that's a million. Is it 100,000? Yeah, that's 100,000 shares traded. So uh, $100,000 worth. So you're looking at a few hundred thousand dollars being traded at best versus millions and millions of dollars for a higher price stock. So that's where you kind of got to factor in lower price stocks with lower volume. That's kind of a double whammy. So it's just too dangerous to trade. But I hear what you're saying. It's taken off. So, but it would have to have a pretty serious correction in here. Uh, maybe correct. I wouldn't say all the way to the base, but maybe correct down in here to about a buck or so, maybe a buck ten at least. But again, I would avoid it. Too thin. Combination of too thin and too cheap. Sometimes I will trade a thin stock. I'm sorry, a cheap stock. But ideally, I want to see a lot of volume in it. TRX, TRX. Um, lots and lots and lots of overhead supply. You should see that. Uh, is it far enough away to, does it matter? Nah, no, I would avoid it. Just I mean, that just kind of jumps right out at me. Kind of like hit you over the head with a halibut. Donald says, Dave, is shorting a REIT stock really good idea? REITs typically pay high dividends, and when you're short a dividend-paid stock, you are the one who pays the dividends. Well, that's a catch-22 situation. It all, wash, it all comes out in the wash. What happens when that stock pays a dividend, okay? So let's take a look at that. So you're short a stock. Oops. You're short a stock, okay, and let's say they pay a $2 dividend, okay? Well, what's going to happen on a day to pay a dividend? The stock is going to drop $2. Yay, I'm telling my friend I just made $2, but you got to pay that dividend. Womp, womp, so you pay your dividend. So it comes out in the wash, and what happens is after people get their dividend, they're probably more inclined to sell the stock. People people are stupid. People will hold off. You know, I don't watch sitcoms that much, but it's kind of like Elaine had her little uh, coupon thing. I seem to remember that. If she got 10 sandwiches, the 11th one was free. And she really didn't like the sandwiches. They were crappy sandwiches. But she kept buying the sandwiches because she wanted that 11th one free. Okay? 
and I think the I don't forget how what happened. The place went out of business or something. She was all upset. But people will hold on to a stock to get a stupid dividend. And dividends are stupid. I'm sorry. Dividends are stupid because a company who pays a dividend is saying, well, we don't know what to do with this money. We don't know how to use, we don't know how to grow this money. So we're going to give it back to you. Here you go. Uh, we, we don't know what to do with it. Why would you ever want to be in a company? Why would you ever want to own a company that pays a dividend? Makes no sense to me. Okay. So if you are in a stock, yeah, as a general state, but you probably want to avoid stocks that play, pay big dividends and yada, yada, yada. But it all comes out to wash. If, if the stock's going to pay a $2 dividend, it's going to drop $2 in a day to pay the dividend, okay, as a general statement. Nothing's certain in the markets. And then I think there's also going to be some selling that's going to come after that dividend because those people that finally got their $2 dividends, they finally got their 11th crappy sandwich for free. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. I would worry about... I would worry about whether or not it's a good setup or not, okay? What market cap is a low end for what would you consider? It depends, Howard. Um, anything less than 500,000 shares on average volume, I take a hard look at, okay, and decide whether or not it's worth trading. Sometimes as a private trader, you could obviously take those trades, okay? I have to be careful if I recommend anything publicly simply because I don't want people to get hurt in a thin trade, okay? Okay. Um, IPOs are really tricky. I spent probably 20, 30 minutes talking about volume and IPOs. To sum, sum it up, you basically, it depends. You kind of have to look to see if you have some big volume days in there to show that there is some sort of participation uh, before jumping in and deciding whether you want to trade it or not. So a little bit more trickier than something like an IPO. For an established stock, 500,000 or more is plenty on the volume. Anything less than 500,000, you have to kind of, Quantify it a little further. Do you really, really like to trade? Do you think it's worth taking? Then take it. Uh, is it a is it a lower price stock like we talked about earlier, to where the volume volume versus dollars makes a big difference? Like volume by dollar number is going to be much, 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 much lower. So you have to be careful. So it depends. But as a general framework, five hundred thousand CLD is a long. That's going to be cloud something. Oops. Uh, good volume. There's your volume. A couple, what's a million point two. Uh, it looks like the mother of all bottoms is in place, but what does Big Dave trade? Anyone? Big Dave trades pullbacks. So, yeah, put it on your watch list for the next pullback. YRD for John. John had to leave, so let me cover this for him. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Uh, I like a little bit more pullback in here, but certainly looks pretty good. And this is another, uh, this is another IPO. Okay, looking pretty good in here. Like I said, look pretty good. And remember, I said earlier that you fly, they died. Notice that this one died, so you would have avoided this trade all the way down. And then, as it begins going higher, then you can consider it. So sometimes they die and then fly. And as long as they're dying, you just avoid them. And that's the beauty of uh, the IPOs. ALG for John went out, VH. Uh, ALD. Uh, this is an Asian fund. A ALD? Well, it's super, super thin, okay? So you got to be careful there. They traded, what, 8,000 shares today? 800 shares today. So I would avoid that. Oh, ALG, sorry. I knew you knew better. Um, it really didn't break out that much from this prior little base in here. Uh, in fact, let me just clean it up. Did we talk about this? We must have talked about this one last week. Um, it really, it's kind of choppy and all over the place, okay? And it really didn't, it, it had all these peaks and all back here. And it really didn't clear them, and now it's coming back in. So, yeah, I would avoid that. Yeah, I don't see anything there worthwhile. E-M-X-X, E-M-X-X. -X. Uh, yeah, we talked about this one. Yeah, we talked about that one. 
You're welcome, John. John without the H. <laughs> Made it despite go to wherever it was best, best best efforts to not let me in. Yeah, I, I used to be able to set up like a year's worth of um, webinars. Now it only lets me do a few, so I got to work on that. I need to clone myself. NRP, NRP. Uh, yeah, looks good. Nice persistent trade. Did we talk about this one? Needs a pullback, obviously. XRA. XRA. Uh, no, because, you know, draw your lines in here. Look at your net net. It's kind of, well, net net doesn't work in a volatile stock, does it? But you could see it's, well, yeah, it does if you pick the right bars, I guess. Net net, it's actually down from where it was nearly a month ago. So I don't see anything here worth trading, but if it breaks out to make new highs, then obviously on a pullback. So, yeah, by all means, put on your watch list with all the other metals, as we've been talking about. AMRN. AMRN. Um, it's a pretty serious move higher. I'd wait for a knockout move. Okay. Too far. That's a pretty big move, but uh, yeah, maybe on a knockout move might be worthwhile. So far, so good. TRX. Um, well, it's kind of pulling back to where it's prior peak in here. And we talked about this one. Yeah, we talked about this. Uh, HV, a little crazy at 146. John has a write in for XLNX. Uh, no, because you really hadn't cleared these prior peaks just yet. And it also looks like a bit of electrocardiogram. Yes, it's improved as of late, but a little, uh, choppy longer term and sideways. Okay. We're running out of questions. Any, um, any more stock picks? E N T G E N T G. Well, my only problem is you just have this one big bar up. Okay, for the breakout. And ideally, with the breakout, you want to see it happen over a period of days, and you just don't want one, you just don't want to see one big bar up. Okay. Longer term, the personality is just kind of uh, crazy in this one. It's up, it's down, it's up. It's, it's a Jackie Mason stock longer term. So I would avoid it based on the fact that we just have one big update in here. Now, if it continues to follow through to the upside, then by all means on pullbacks, okay? There's a stock at the landry list with a 16% yield. Would you still take this setup or wait until the next dividend? Well, if it's got a 16% yield, then there's something wrong. There's probably something wrong uh, with the stock. Um, I wouldn't worry about it. Uh... No, I wouldn't worry about it. Uh... Which one is that? I wonder. You could tell me which one. You could uh, type it into questions, and I'll, we could take a look at it. Maybe. I know in general I say don't mention stocks in Los Angeles. CRNT for Carol. CRNT. Uh, that looks okay. Uh, I'd like to see a little bit more pullback in here, but it looks okay. Uh, longer term, you do have a lot of issues. I know it's going back a few years, but that would kind of be in the back of my mind. But it, it looks okay. Maybe a little bit more pullback, okay? Uh, but you're going to get f uh, quite a few days into pullback, though. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So, yeah, unless it, it pulled back like today or tomorrow, I probably would take that one off. And then the other thing that's got me concerned, again, is all this overhead supply back here. Sometimes markets have pretty long memories. Oh, really? Okay. I didn't know that. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't factor that in. I wouldn't worry about that. Uh, I'll have to research that. But, yeah, I ignore all that stuff anyway. But that's interesting. Thanks for the, um, for the heads up on that. Usually a high dividend means that there's something wrong with the stock. But in that particular case, that stock is traded higher. Uh, no, this stock is all over the place. You had this big wide range bar here. It would have to break out and I'll look back for a while for me to get excited about that. Yeah, I don't always fully understand what you're looking at, Andre, but 
I know sometimes you pick some really good stocks, and sometimes you don't. Yeah, this is another one of those IPOs that's taken off in more recent time. We were actually long in this when it got shaken out. We talked about this one last week. Um, yeah, on a pullback, it's nice. It's in a nice, nice persistent uptrend. Look how beautiful that is. Uh, but it's going to have to have a little bit of a pullback in here. Boy, nice little TKO move would be really great on that one. G-I-M-O for Bill. I don't mean to pick on you, Andre. Sorry about that. But you do pick some good stocks. But I don't understand some of the ones you pick, some of the wide and loose ones. Uh, yeah, put this on your watch list. But it needs to, ideally, I like to see it accelerate higher a little bit more and then pull back. But even if it pulls back in here, it could be worthwhile. It's worth watching. TWLO, yeah, the TWLO is on the lander list. It needs a little bit more pullback. Well, that one took off today, didn't it? No, I've got it mixed up. Yeah, it looks okay. Um, a little bit more lenient with IPOs, but, yeah, that one looks okay. <laughs> No, you pick some really good stocks sometimes, Andre, and then every now and then you pick stocks. I have no idea what's going on in your head. So, but that's okay. That's what makes a market. Uh, yeah, this one came all the way back in, so this would be scratch this one off your list. And notice that it had that little bottle rocket take off. It just went, it just shot straight higher, which is usually a dangerous time, time to trade. That's why we wait for pullbacks, and then it pulled back all the way to its prior breakout. So, yeah, toss that one out. ENTG. Like, what are you seeing there, Andre? I mean, I, this is – why would you want to trade that stock? Because it, it, it to me, it, it shot higher and came all the way back in. So I don't I don't see what you're seeing in that. But, hey, that's what makes a girl, world go around. The girl go around? Yeah, we talked about that one. All right, any more? We talk about, yeah, we talked about that one. Buy dips. Oh, yeah, but that's – yeah, but well, the, the methodology says you buy dips. But remember, we were talking about stops earlier, and in stops, we, we were having that conversation. We were saying, where would you be wrong? So – criminy. How do we get the uh, pen back? Let's try that one more time. Here we go. So, yeah, by dips, you're looking to play pullbacks along the way, but you're not saying, okay, you've got a base, stock breaks out. You, this is not a dip, okay? And then I guess in a particular case of the other stock, it's like, this is not a dip. If you come back in below your prior high, if you come back in below your prior breakout, as per my methodology, it's no longer a dip. It's no longer a correction. It could be the start of something bigger. Like we said earlier, the stops, where would you be wrong? Well, you'd be wrong somewhere in here or somewhere in here if you were long or already long that stock. So, But it's not my way or the highway. If there's something you're doing, then do it. I know like Phil, I don't know if he's in here today because of the link problem, but Phil likes trading around the 50-day moving average, and I think that's that's conceptually correct. And I I don't necessarily do it like he does, but I can't argue with him for doing that. Now, if you I I can argue with something like this, but if you find a way to make that work, then don't let me mess you up. Take what I do and make your stuff work even better. FTV for Howard, and we're almost. I think we're closing in on the. Uh, now we we'll get a little time. FTV. Any final requests? No, you see, this is another example of fly or die with an IPO. So the stock came public. It hit its high in its first day so far. So you would avoid this one. Watch the intro video on the IPOs. If you don't get the course, at least watch the intro video. And trust me, as Steve has pointed out, you get one, you catch one good IPO. And you pay for that course 10 times over. And I know it's a soft sell, but I believe in it, and it works. Now, will the bull market end tomorrow? I don't know. I hope it doesn't. But the good news is, as I said the course, because I was worried about the bull market ended three years ago, I said, what's the best – what's the what's – the what's, <laughs> what's the best time? What's the best time to plant a tree? Well, 20 years ago, okay? What's the next best time today? 
So at least you'll have that knowledge if the bull market ends tomorrow for the next bull market. You're welcome, Andre. You're welcome, John. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. Looks like that's that's it for the questions. Uh, thank you guys for showing up. Sorry about all the link troubles. Uh, that'll that'll be resolved from now on, hopefully, or forever. Uh, if we don't talk again, everybody have a great weekend. Hopefully see all you guys and girls again next weekend, or next week, I should say. Uh, I think that's it. So thanks again, everyone.